Hello, I am Prabir De from RIS in New Delhi. I am going to speak on regionalism in international relations. This presentation, I will talk about why regionalism is so popular, how regionalism has evolved over time, what is the current status of regionalism in the world, and then there will be some conclusions at the end. Now, let's come to the first point, why regionalism is so popular. As you all know that multilateral process under WTO primarily doesn't work all the time as per our expectations. Some countries who are WTO members, they can tell that, look, I am not interested or I am not happy with the multilateral process. I would like to form, along with some other countries, a regional block, which we call in WTO term, is called regional trading arrangements. So countries, those who are WTO members, under Article 24 of GATT of 1994, under Enabling Clause and under Article 5 of GATS, three clauses allow WTO member countries to form a regional trading arrangements, in short, regional blocks in literature. So as of now, on 1st of February in 2021, there are more than 500 notifications to the WTO and of which 339 RTAs are come in force. So as you can see, 448 notifications are there for counting out goods, services, and there are many types of accessions. Let me tell you that there are advantages also on the regional trading arrangements. Why countries form regional trading Arrangements primarily dictated or motivated by scale economy. Their voices, if not hard in WTO, countries they form regional blocks, primarily economic relations and geostrategic and other issues like culture, civilizations. There are many access to water. There are many non-economic issues as well. They motivate countries to form regional trading arrangements. There are advantages there are disadvantages as well. Now, the regional blocks has become a very powerful tool in the international affairs. As of now, as I said, 548 and notifications and WTO. If you see the distribution of the regional trading arrangements across the world, you will find most of it are in European Union countries. So, European Union, you know, they are the champion of regional trading arrangements and, is, and we know very well that European Union, they form the first regional trading blocks almost about 70 years back. And since then, you know, cluster of regional trading arrangements are in the Europe, followed by countries in the Southeast Asia. ASEAN, for example, is one of the best popular regional trading arrangements. And also in the North America, which we call the NAFTA. Now, if you see, you know, who are the countries are left out or countries yet to join in the regional trading arrangements, you can see that almost every country is now part of regional trading arrangements in the world. The companion, the figures and maps and graphs in all literature on the regional trading arrangements, they tell you almost every country are part of RTS across the world, except three. Which are the three countries? One is Somalia, one is South Sudan, and another is Mauritania in Africa. Other than these three, all are somewhere directly involved in regional trading arrangements. Now, there is a sharp rise in regional trading arrangements across the world, and we see over 65% of the world trade is rooted through the regional trading arrangements as of now. And this rise is very sharp in the 90s. Because 90s, almost all of the WTO member countries, except China, China joined in 2000, they joined WTO. And WTO process, which is the MFN process, came in, in, came in existence in 1995. So 1995, an institution and thereby several countries joining WTO process, exchanging MFN principles, countries, they agreed 
to go for regional trading arrangements. So far, 347 goods agreement, 173 services agreement, they are notified to WTO. And there are sharp rise, if you see the curve, which is primarily in the 90s. So countries moved into regional trading blocks from the 90s onward. Let me tell you the types of economic integration and level of complexity. It's not so easy that countries go and form regional trading arrangements. There is an eminent scholar and very eminent professor called Bela Balasa. You know, in 61, she came out with a publication, a book called Towards a Theory of Economic Integrations. She was the first to tell us that there are four stages the countries can join from preferential trading arrangements, then the country can go for a free trade agreement. From free trade agreement, they go for a customs union, common market, and economic union. Now, if you see the level of complexities, there as if you go, if you keep on adding in the features for going for a free trade, simple preferential trading arrangements, from there to customs union, from customs union to common market, and from common market to economic union, there are many issues. It's not so easy. It takes time. Now, preferential trading arrangement, what do we mean by the preferential trading agreements or arrangements? Some countries, they decide to exchange trade preferences, customs concessions to each other, and they form a sort of a cartel, and we call it preferential trading agreement. Now, after exchanging preferences, trade preferences, prim primarily the customs simplifications, customs liberalizations, so those actually lead from preferential trading arrangement to free trade agreement. Now, difference between preferential agreement and free trade agreement? Preferential agreement only is subset of the whole custom duties that the countries they pay agreed for liberalizations. From free trade agreement, once you know they go and agree to all the countries to liberalize most of their products, we call it the free trade. So everything the countries in the group they produce, they would like to trade are less fair. From there, we call this is a free trade agreement. Now countries don't stop in the free trade agreement, they move from free trade agreement all the way again to the economic union. Now, customs union come in between free trade agreement and economic union. What is customs union? Customs union means that the member countries of a regional bloc, they feel that we need a customs to control our goods and whatever we are trading, but they prefer there should not be any discrimination in terms of crossing the goods from one country to another country and there won't be any kind of non-tariff barriers. In trade, non-tariff barriers and non-tariff measures, they are very complex elements. They are the real barriers. So once you form a customs union, then you see that the countries, they do away with all kind of non-tariff measures. So almost everything being produced in a country are allowed to exchange from one part of the country to another part of another partner country. So this is we call customs union. Now from the customs union, then we move into an economic union. The difference between customs union to economic union is that in case of economic union, countries, they decide that they will allow free flow of capital, labor, resources. For example, once a customs union is formed and from their member countries, they prefer to go for an economic union, some of the member countries, they decide that they will not stop people or laborers coming from another trade partner of that regional bloc. So they allow free flow of investment, free flow of movement of laborers. Almost it is sort of an going into you know, engaging with all kind of you know, national accounts uh, of one country with another country. And this is leading to very much convergence of rules, regulations, and gradually moving into non-economic areas 
like one defense, one agriculture policy, one transport policy, one parliament, one flag, one national arrangements like that. So this is the achievement called European Union and they go for a common currency. So this whole process, there is a no fixed term or no fixed time. The countries, they achieve from forming a preferential trading arrangement to a free trade agreement, to a customs union, to an economic union, and then to a political union. It takes a long time and only single example we can give, it's an European Union, this is the only example. Other regional blocks, whatever we have, so far they could not achieve so much that European Union as a bloc has achieved. Now the European Union, they have their common currency, European Union has a common parliament, they have a common rules regulation, convergences and all arrangements. But European Union also has setback like United Kingdom, you know, they came out of European Union, we call Brexit. So, so in short, the typology of integration schemes, you know, as in my presentation tells you that there are, you know, three phases if you go, you know, add on complexities on the regional, regionalism or as regionalism is a tool in the international relations, we need to look at primarily, you know, freedom of movement in the community in terms of goods, services, capital labor, which most of the countries of a regional bloc, they can achieve in medium to short term to medium term. But when you go for, you know, something like customs union, common market, economic union, political union, which are that, you know, very difficult to achieve in short or medium term, it takes a long term. So, so in short, that regionalism, you know, it is a very tempting, but at the same time, there are many, many drawbacks, many disadvantages, and as well as many advantages. So if you compare with the multilateral process and regional process, the advantage is multilateral that the all countries are equal to all their trade partners, no discrimination among countries, but when it comes to regionalism, be it a preferential free trade agreement, customs union, economic union, remind you that regionalism discriminates the non-members. So as you have seen that European Union has signed so many agreements with the non-members. ASEAN has signed so many agreements with the non-members. Now these non-members are they not a member directly, but sometimes it's called dialogue partners, sometimes it's called FTA partners. Example is ASEAN has a 10 dialogue partners from Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Korea, India, USA and Russia. And none, you know, many of them have signed bilateral free trade agreement with ASEAN. So, so the point that we take from the, my presentation and my discussion is that there is a clear motivation for regionalism. And the motivation is that in a regional block, if the bigger countries, bigger economies, they contribute more in, in the regional organizations. They contribute more in terms of resources, in terms of you know, you know, arrangements for looking after the security, in terms of looking at non-economic areas. So other member countries who are economically smaller than the bigger one, they feel tempted, they feel motivated to be there. So in a neighborhood, you know, in my presentations, you will find just a schematic illustration is that if you have a country like C1, C2, and C3, and C4, so countries C1, C2, and C3, they form a regional block, and country C4, if they come you know, and join, or many other countries, you know, they prefer to join in the regional block, Sustainability is important only when it will sustain when the bigger economies be a member or be a non-member, they contribute towards the development through the connectivity in terms of culture, in terms of security, in terms of non-traditional security, for example, you know, looking at the trade resilience, infrastructure resilience, maritime corporations like that. So, so over time what I found from 1948 onwards till 2011 or 2012, we found that 
regional blocks characters have also undergone a transformation earlier it was economy driven now we found more into non economic elements becoming very important now what are the salient features of rta lead integration process the common features we will find trade liberalization very common any kind of a regional trading agreements will have a trade liberalization removal of non tariff measures countries agree to remove non tariff measures at least the process they discuss difficult to remove non tariff measures bit complex but countries they agree to join hand to remove the non tariff measures today tariff is not so important what is important is the non tariff measures countries they talk about customs cooperations countries talk about investment cooperation regional trading arrangements very much into the promotion facilitation of value chain and production linkages and then comes the trade facilitation and connectivity development and technology cooperation so these are the common features of any kind of a regional trading agreements there are some regional blocks or regional cooperation programs which is purely based on non economics for example the regional blocks which is we found that bbin bangladesh bhutan india nepal it doesn't talk about the trade cooperations it talk about non economic like energy security waters it talks about transport connectivity like that now if you come to safta south asia free trade agreement it is it's a free trade agreement by the way if you come to apta asia pacific trade agreement it's a free trade agreement so there are free trade agreements purely based on the trade relations purely based on the commitment in the trade agreement there are agreements as well which talk about non trade non economics and i have given an example bbin for example in that sense bimstech for example it is not a free trade agreement either bimstech so far hasn't signed any fta and bimstech fta is being discussed in among the bimstech countries there are some good achievements but it's not yet signed so so some of the popular regional blocks as i said that is european union nafta sarc asean saku south asia south, south africa customs union gcc gulf cooperation council apec sanghai cooperation organization ior indian ocean regional limb association marcosur pif pif is pacific island forum and these are the regional blocks and i had an opportunity to look at all of them minutely they talk about trade and economic relations it talks about food security and agriculture it talks about connectivity development value chain science and technology cooperation customs cooperation and sectoral cooperation like education tourism etc etc let's come to uh, the recent development in the regional program which is called indo pacific now indo pacific as you have seen from the literature in the last two years the rise of indo pacific is primarily influence of china's belt and road initiative i'm not going to talk about chinese bri but bri is as you know it is sort of creating or dividing the world into two groups so certainly it's not good in all all if you consider you know a rule based order of the global global order so countries they look for an alternate to the built and road initiative which is always the you know countries they look for an alternate for any kind of if there is an one one arrangements or a very smaller arrangements they concentrate on the create a cartel so indo pacific cooperation is somewhere where the countries they feel that they need to form a rule based arrangement in the world as i said that in you know few years back the countries they look for more from a trade related development trade related integration into in the non economic areas the maritime cooperation the blue economy those became very popular now indo pacific cooperation is who are the members of indo pacific cooperation is asean countries which are the pivot or asean countries southeast and south asian countries that is the, is the central to indo pacific it it is indo pacific basically primarily it is indian ocean countries pacific ocean countries 
Indian Prime Minister in his speech at Mauritius which he delivered it's called Sagar security and growth for all in the region and the Sagar means Samudra and it is Indian Ocean and later on the Prime Minister of India you know he delivered a speech at Sangrila in 2018 where he talked about free open prosperous and inclusive Indo-Pacific. Now the countries which are part of a quad like United States of America, Japan, India, Australia, they always look for a greater regional bloc which can talk about, which can, which can promote the rules-based global order, not just in trade but also in the non-economic areas. And Indo-Pacific somehow fulfilled that gap. And gradually we found there are 44 countries that have shown interest. Some countries which are not a part, which are purely sharing water bodies in Indian Ocean or a Pacific Ocean, they also shown interest like Germany, to some extent the France. France has a tiny island in Indian Ocean. Other than that, France doesn't have any deep involvement in Indian Ocean in sharing the water bodies. But France has came out with his own versions, country's own versions. So, so for the last two, three years, what I found the Indo-Pacific has gained considerable momentum. By the way, in the regionalism, there was a big challenge that to control the noodle ball, the spaghetti ball, what Professor Vagabati popularly said. So many regional organizations came in and there is a fatigue among the countries to follow up those. So there was a requirement and need for consolidation of regional blocks. And Indo-Pacific, that is why, became very popular. It gives a flip to consolidation. It talks about coming together in common challenges in the water, development of infrastructure, connectivity, and issues which are, we cannot deal with other multilateral regional bodies, including the existing regional blocks. So we found in the last two, three years, there are six, seven countries, they introduced their vision, their versions to Indo-Pacific. India, Germany, France, USA, Australia, Japan. Japan is the first to introduce a free and open Indo-Pacific, followed by United States, Australia, India, France, Germany, and ASEAN as well. ASEAN came out with the ASEAN outlook of Indo-Pacific in 2019 in July. And Indian Prime Minister, uh, he introduced the Indian vision, Indian version of Indo-Pacific in November in 2019 in Bangkok at the 14th East Asia Summit, which we call Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. So in short, Indo-Pacific is gaining momentum. There are many countries, one by one, they're showing interest. And in, if you look at the numbers, you know, it has a very impressive attributes. Whenever you form a regional blocks, you need to talk about are these regional blocks going, going to give us additional trade? Are this regional, is this regional block uh, going to give us more scope for prosperity? So if you look at Indo-Pacific region, today it, it covers 43.45% of the surface area, 65% of the population, you know, global population, it, talk, it is having 62% of the world GDP at the current US dollar, 45% of the global exports, 47% of the global imports and goods, and 46% of the global trade. These are actually rooted through Indo-Pacific region. And Indo-Pacific, compared to the European Union, doesn't have any kind of a free trade agreement. European Union has signed an FTA. It went from a preferential FTA customs union to economic union. It has a common currency. But look at the Indo-Pacific regional trade. Today, it is having 72% of the inter-regional trade. So there is a huge amount of trades happening in the Indo-Pacific region. It has, you know, the beauty of the Indo-Pacific, unlike you know, other regional blocks, EU, the big challenge is that the member countries have reached a convergence of, in terms of per capita income. So there, there is a hardly any kind of variance or any kind of you know, disparity you will watch in, or in notice in European Union. So society has been saturated. It is aging society on the top. So Indo-Pacific in that way, it is heterogeneous. It has a developed country. It has a developing world. It has a least developed country. Out of 43 members, Indo-Pacific 
have been rising interregional trade while 72% of the interregional trade is conducted in Indo-Pacific. Now the 72% of the interregional trade Indo-Pacific has achieved without any FTA, without any customs union. So if you have more regional cooperation in Indo-Pacific, we can create the countries that feel that they can, they can generate more trade in the region. And by doing a closer cooperation in terms of trade, investment, connectivity, non-traditional security, maritime corporations, Indo-Pacific countries can come out with a new template in the world. We talked about Indo-Pacific as a maritime cooperation, maritime security, maritime safety. So those are the issues countries that don't get an opportunity to deal with anywhere in WTO or any other regional bloc. So Indo-Pacific, that is why it is so you know, important for the countries, small, tiny, tiny, tiny economies in the Indian Ocean or Pacific Oceans to talk, you know, to be a part of Indo-Pacific and share their benefits, advantages, or maybe they get an opportunity to understand other countries' benefit, advantages. So, so, so Indo-Pacific is going to be a new powerhouse uh, for the global trade, global development. But Indo-Pacific is also having a couple of challenges, which NTMs, which is the primarily the biggest challenge in the non-tariff measures, anti-dumping duties, quotas, restriction of the movement of people, of professionals. These are the big issues, big challenges also in WTO, also in Indo-Pacific. Now countries, they don't feel comfortable dealing with all these big challenges in WTO, but they can do easily in Indo-Pacific. That's what we found in the Pacific United States having a different views when it talks about movement of visa regime in the United States of America. But that doesn't applicable to WTO, all the member countries, but United States offers to selected members of Indo-Pacific. So this is the beauty and advantage of having in regional corporations where the countries, they contribute, the bigger countries, they contribute. Remember what I said in the previous presentation, you know, in my talk that success or sustainability of regional blocks, regionalism is, or regionalism is a powerful tool in international relations only when the bigger economies, bigger countries, they have to contribute more and more. So if you expand the group, you will find the simulations, you know, I did along with Masudur Rahman and which came out in Journal of Economic Structure in last year from the Springer. We had a computable general equilibrium modeling and we found that if you expand the group with an Indo-Pacific say 43 countries, welfare is more and more and if the welfare, economic welfare is more and if you control it, if you monitor it well, then you will distribute the benefits across the countries. So let me conclude, you know, my talk on regionalism as a, in international relations. I discussed about rise of regionalism. I discussed about how regionalism has evolved in the, from 1948 onwards till now, till 1st of February 2021. How regionalism has empowered smaller countries, smaller economies, more than what WTO are supposed to do. Now let me conclude in some of the takeaways from my presentations that regionalism, a powerful tool in international affairs, there's no doubt about it. But too much regionalism is also bad because as you see the spaghetti ball and noodle ball syndrome that it is a kind of a fatigue that people, countries, they get confused. For example, the ASEAN India Free Trade Agreement. If you look at the utilization rate of ASEAN India Free Trade Agreement, you will find it's not more than 25 percent on average. But why it is so low? Because there are many other free trade agreements available to trade between ASEAN and India. So why the trading community, exporters and importers, they will use that single one. They will happen when there are multiple options. So regionalism is good, but we have to be careful. Regionalism pays well only when you monitor it, you control it, you add new values, and then the countries will come back and renew its interest. Point number two, that Indo-Pacific, 
which is in the, the new one in, in, in the recent in the last two or three years, the rise of in, in earlier it was that European Union, the largest regional bloc, but European Union disadvantage that there is in you know the society is rich to kind of in same or same or same or economic in terms of per capita income they have converged over time. So even though they have 60 to 70 percent of the trade within themselves, but because of the aging society, they need new capital, new labor, new life to, to the region. So there is a doubt that European Union as a regional bloc, well, how long they will sustain. And that's why we found there is an one member has exit from here, this is called Brexit. And this kind of an exit will eventually come more and more. And next is the rise of Indo-Pacific and I, I discussed and I, we published several documents that Indo-Pacific is the future. Countries, United States of America, Japan, Australia, ASEAN countries, India, several European countries, they are showing interest. And you will find that these are the countries will elevate the current level of discourse into more serious level. And who knows that we will see an Indo-Pacific summit coming up. Who knows the Indo-Pacific free trade agreement, a deeper integrations eventually will evolve in next, you know, in coming years. Last point is that, that India's presence in Indian Ocean, this is, is the crucial because India share water body is Indian Ocean and Indo-Pacific is Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean together. So India, Indonesia, which is a fulcrum of Indo-Pacific, they are going to play a major role in reshaping in Indo-Pacific architecture. And India in particular, that India's powers in maritime sectors, so maritime cooperation, maritime connectivity, maritime security, those will be very much important catalytic elements in running the Indo-Pacific in coming, you know, coming years and in the next in the next decade. And finally, anything you do, you know, regional blocks, you need to focus more into a cooperation than liberalization. Binding liberalizations are sometimes it is too much problematic. Countries they they hesitate to go for a binding relations. So cooperations is more important where you know you will allow smaller economies, smaller countries, those are vulnerable countries, island countries landlocked countries like Nepal, Bhutan, Afghanistan, Laupedia, they feel attracted, they feel more interest in it. So focus in Indo-Pacific or be it in any regional bloc, if possible, should be cooperation than the liberalization. And you need a champion country, political you know, leaderships. So I think that India and Japan are partnerships is going to receive the Asian integration process and Indo-Pacific integration as well. So thank you very much.